Hello everyone! Here I am with another Godzilla review, and this time we're gonna look at the 5th Millennium Era film and 28th movie in the franchise, Tokyo SOS. Also known as Godzilla x Mothra x Mechagodzilla Tokyo SOS, but that's kind of a mouthful. This one is a direct sequel to the last movie, Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, and the continuation of the Kiryu Saga, and I think it has my favorite promotional art of all the movies in the Millennium series. I've been looking forward to seeing this one based on this design alone. The story picks up shortly after where Godzilla against Mechagodzilla left off. Mechagodzilla, or Kiryu, built from the original 1954 Godzilla's bones, is still undergoing repairs after the battle at the end of the last movie. Meanwhile, the Japanese Xenomorph Self-Defense Force searches for Godzilla, and Japan nervously braces for his return. In the midst of this, a UFO is sighted in the Pacific. The Air Force approaches it, only to discover that rather than an alien spacecraft, it's Mothra! Yay! Well, yay for us. Scary for them. Mothra is accompanied by the Shobijin, who bring a message that Godzilla's bones must be returned to the sea. Dismantling Kiryu will leave Japan virtually defenseless, but they promise that Mothra will protect Japan from Godzilla in Kiryu's place. The arrival of Mothra throws everybody off, making an already controversial situation even trickier. The government's telling the press that everything's fine, Mechagodzilla's almost ready, but the mechanics say it isn't. People are expressing doubts about the project again, and budgetary restrictions are hampering the necessary repairs. Then throw Mothra into the mix. Mothra, who according to this movie's history, was last seen destroying Tokyo in 1961. Not everyone believes the story about Mothra's return and the fairy twins' message, but if it's true, they just as soon scrap Mechagodzilla and let Mothra protect them. Yet others fear that Godzilla and Mothra will just team up and attack together. Taking a dangerous gamble on Mothra's benevolence is something the Prime Minister just doesn't want to do, and the poor man looks downright sick about the decisions he has to make. This movie has pretty good continuity with the last one. There are a few recurring characters, like the Prime Minister and his Minister of Defense. Also, a few members of the JXSDF, including Akane, the main character from the last movie, who has a dramatic cameo appearance before heading off to the US for additional training. She sort of passes the baton to the main character here, Chujo, an Air Force mechanic who works with Mechagodzilla on the ground. He strongly believes in using Kiryu to fight Godzilla and opposes the Shobijin's order, even though he was one of only three eyewitnesses who received it. There are a couple additional new characters who I found to be a little vague, not quite developed. There's a new female pilot who seems to like Chujo, and he seems to like her, but he's not actually that interested, or he just has a lot of other things on his mind. And there's a hotshot pilot with ninja-like reflexes who's a jerk, and then suddenly isn't a jerk anymore. I think I missed the cue when he became someone I was supposed to like. But as is the case in many other Godzilla movies, the strongest emotional focus is on family. Chujo has a warm, positive relationship with his young nephew, and they live with Chujo's uncle and the boy's grandfather, who, da 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 da, is played by Hiroshi Koitsumi, one of my favorites! He's older here, but in my opinion, he's still the kindest looking man in the Godzilla verse. And even better, he's returning as the character he played in the original Mothra, who first made contact with the fairies. I love that they did that! In fact, there are quite a few nods to that movie here, and I'd say it has a few nods to Mothra vs. Godzilla as well, but maybe I only feel that way because I just rewatched it last week. This movie also features a cameo from another Toho monster. A giant turtle carcass washes ashore and is identified as Kamibas, a kaiju who appears in 1970's Space Amoeba, which I haven't seen, but don't worry, it's already on the things to watch after Godzilla list. This led to what I thought was the funniest line in the movie, kind of a fourth wall breaker. Tokyo SOS didn't turn out to be quite the Godzilla Kiryu rematch I was expecting, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, as that would get old pretty fast. On the contrary, I feel like neither Godzilla nor Mechagodzilla do quite as much here as they did in the last movie. 
They fight, of course, and they have a couple intense moments, but the action struck me as being a little slower paced, which is interesting since both movies were made by the same director, Masaki Tezuka. For Godzilla's part, he has a chest injury that hasn't fully healed, so I imagine he's not quite operating at maximum capacity. And hey, remember how last time I said that the visual effect for his atomic breath charging reminded me of a light flickering on? Well, now it even sounds like that. Godzilla might have seemed a little stiff to me, but Mothra definitely did not. I'm sure there are a lot of digital effects used here, it might be completely digital, but these fluid movements as Mothra flies over the city are great. This Mothra design is so soft and fluffy, or downy, hairy, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, it's a very tactile design. And I don't know the specs, but it seems like they might have widened her wingspan and perhaps made the wings with a lighter material to allow them to be super flappy. I know, that's really technical. And with Mothra, we also have a return of the gold dust! It's like watching a Heisei movie again. Many thanks to the grandfather for providing an explanation for all the glitter. Apparently it's Mothra using her scales, a last resort when she knows she's not going to be able to fight much longer. So it does have a function, but it's also aesthetically pleasing, just like almost everything associated with Mothra. One of the coolest moments is the scene where the little boy makes the Mothra symbol out of desks and chairs. That little kid carried all that stuff out of the building by himself while everyone else is running around in an evacuation panic? That's impressive. And then Mothra comes to the rescue, and I really like the mysterious, exotic melody that Michiru Oshima wrote for the scene. You know I've always enjoyed the appearance of the fairy twins and seeing how they've been updated over the decades. In this instance, there's a slight height difference between the two actresses, which kind of mars the illusion of symmetry, but that's nitpicky. And in this movie, they twice exhibit powers of telekinesis that I didn't realize they had. But a big highlight for me, and this will come as no surprise, I'm sure, to anyone who's been watching these reviews, is the return of Yuji Koseki's Mothra song. Yay! The movie continues with the established theme that perhaps Kiryu's existence is a mistake, and everything comes full circle. Kiryu went rogue in his first outing with disastrous results. Now, in a climactic, Iron Giant-like moment, Kiryu goes rogue again, but with a different, satisfying outcome. Kiryu gets a couple great images here, a moment that I call the Terminator Eye, and this excellent shot. On the whole, I think I'm going to say that I liked the first movie, Godzilla Against Mechagodzilla, better. I might be in the minority there, but Godzilla Against Mechagodzilla had more moments that I got really excited about. Even though both movies have a somber mood, that one felt a little more fun, the emotional moments were nicely balanced with awesome eye candy, it also wasn't as heavy-handed as this one when it came to its messages, and was a little more direct when it came to characters and relationships. But that movie did not have all the Mothra stuff or the return of Hiroshi Koitsumi, so... I don't know, they're meant to go together. You can't have one without the other. You can't have the first part without the second part. You can't have the second part without the first part. And as a duology, I think it works pretty well. We are in the home stretch here, I can't believe it. One millennium movie left to go, and it's a doozy. I am looking forward to finally seeing Godzilla Final Wars. I hope that you enjoyed this review. Share your thoughts in the comments below if you like, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching!